الحمد لله الحمد لله ذي الجلال والإكرام والفضل والإنعام أمننا بسلة الأرحام وعادنا على ذلك الأجور العظام وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمد عبد الله ورسوله أوصل الناس برحمه وبرهم بقرابه قرابته فاللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وعلى من تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فعسيكم عباد الله ونفسي بتقوى الله تعالى قال الله سبحانه وتعالى واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا Brothers and sisters in Islam Alhamdulillah this is the first khutbah after Eid al-Adha and uh, Alhamdulillah those days before Eid and the day of Eid and the days after Eid are reminders Reminders of what? The reminder is in the name Adha, which means sacrifice. And it's a commemoration of the rites of Hajj. And the word Hajj literally means Qasd, an aim, making Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala your aim. And it ends with the commemoration or the celebration that also remembers the act of Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam. And what was that act? We said in the khutbah that Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam saw in his dream as if, and I have to preface as if, as if he was killing his son Ishmael alayhi salam. It appeared as if he was killing his son. He saw a ru'ya in which his son was lying down and he was moving a knife. Now for us to understand the power of that ru'ya and the fact that that ru'ya was not just for Ibrahim salam, that ru'ya was for you and me. And I'll come to this. That vision that Ibrahim salam saw was just as powerful a vision for you and me if we understand what does it mean. But for us to understand the significance of that ru'ya, we have to take a back step. And even though those days of Eid have gone, the significance of what that meant is still in our lives and will continue to be in our lives as long as we are in this dar, this abode, this imtihan, dar al-imtihan, the abode of the test. What is the test? The test is intricately linked to that ru'ya, that dream. And for us to understand the significance of that dream which was Sayyidina Ibrahim appearing to sacrifice his son, we have to take a step back because the ulama of interpretations of dreams say dreams can be of two types. There is a literal dream, a dream which literally forecasts what is going to happen in the future? And our Prophet وسلم, in the first six months of his Nabuwa would see a dream and the very next day or in a short span of time, what he saw in his dream would come to pass. This is the type of dream which literally tells you what is going to happen in the future. And this can happen to any of us because the Prophet وسلم, said, is that the degree of revelation that remains is a ru'yat al-sadiqah, is a true dream. And the degree to which you can get a true dream is dependent on the degree to which your heart is of a heart of safa, a heart of purity. Because dreams can get admixed. So this could have been one of those dreams. But another type of dream is, they call it the dream of Yusufiyah. The Yusuf type dream, named after the Prophet Yusuf which is a dream, and this is the majority of dreams, 
where the madda, the subject matter, is khayal, it's imaginary. In other words, what you see in the dream is symbolic of something else. Sayyidina Yusuf salam saw in his dream, he, throws, he saw seven cows. Seven cows made fat. And what was this symbolic of? He later interpreted this as being seven years of abundance and then there will be seven years of famine. This did not come to him in the dream in terms of a literal state of the years. It came to him as symbolic. One of them was cows and another of them was wheat and agriculture. And he recognized that this was indicating a state that the country will come from. So he took from the imagery a ibra, a message. The imagery was a bridge unto what was the message. And this is the type of dream that also comes to us and also comes to the Anbiya. Okay. Now that I've told you the two types of dreams, Sayyidina Ibrahim saw the dream of his son. And in his first instance, he sees this as being a dream where this is an event that is going to come to pass. He interprets this as an event that he will literally be slaughtering his son. And for the Anbiya, their dreams are not like our dreams in the sense that their wahi is, there's an ongoing relationship of wahi. But if their dream comes in the form of that, they know this is something they have to do. And so he made this the shara. He consulted his son because his son was also a prophet. And he said, I see myself slaughtering you. And his son says, if that is the case, if al matu'ma. Do what it is you've been commanded. Satajiduni insha Allah min as That you will find me from those insha Allah. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was not through myself, but through Allah you will find me of those who are patient. Okay, this is what he saw of his dream. And this is what he thought he has to do. And both him and his son submitted to what they thought Allah wants them to do. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give him a dream of his son. Has anyone ever thought about that? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give him? And before that, Sayyidina Ibrahim was also seeing in his dream that he has to leave at that time his only son Ismail and his wife Hajar in a barren valley of Mecca. Why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, excuse my phrase, out for Sayyidina Ibrahim and his son. Of all the reasons that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing Sayyidina Ibrahim, why is it his son? Has anyone ever thought about that? That's worth reflecting upon, isn't it? To understand why Sayyidina Ibrahim is being tested in his son and his family, we have to take a step back and think about what does the son symbolize for Sayyidina Ibrahim? Sayyidina Ibrahim was a person who from a young age was given this glad tidings. He, was, he knew he was a prophet. His job was to spread this deen al-Hanifa, this pure religion, so and so that he broke the idols that were being built by even though the Qur'an gives the imagery that it might appear to his, be his father, the ulama, of the lives of the Anbiya say that was his uncle Azam. You can say Ab for uncle in Arabic as well. In any case, Sayyidina Ibrahim broke the idols and he put the idol, put the axe or the thing used to break the idols in the hands or the, in, the, in, the, in front of the idol that was the largest. And when they came, he used that as a way to tell them, this is what you worship, false gods. We also know that he would point to the stars, the moon and the sun to try and tell them this is false. Why? Because inni la al afilin. I don't love that which comes and goes. That which you worship, your abudiyah too, has to be that which is the ground of everything that's coming and going. Because everything allow, around us is coming and going. So who is the one who we should worship? The one who is creating it all. And so from a very young age, he's involved in da'wah. And when they grabbed him because they refused to accept him, they threw him through a mandalik, through a catapult into a fire. 
And the narrations tell us that Jibreel السلام, came to him at that point and said, Alaka Haja, do you have a need? And Sayyidina Ibrahim says, Amma ilayka fakalla wa amma la rabbika faballa. He said, as for from you, he said, I don't need anything from you, but as for my Lord, of course I'm in need. So Jibreel said, Fas'alhu, then ask him. And Sayyidina Ibrahim said, Ilmuhu bihali, yughnini an su'ali. He said, his reality of knowing my state saves me from having to ask him for anything. This is a maqam. Some of the ulama say, this depends on what Allah wants. There are times when Allah wants you to just know that he knows. And your lisan al-hal doesn't need you just to ask him. And there are other times when it's awla to make idhar al to manifest your ubudiyah by asking. What dua mukhul ibadah and dua is simply a manifestation of your ubudiyah. It's not a demand list upon Allah. It's not expecting something to happen because Allah is the one who promises how that dua will be answered, whether it will be answered in the way it's answered. But your dua is a chance to ask Allah. And we say Sayyidina Ibrahim was thrown in and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He told the fire to be bardan wa salama, cool and safe. And then Sayyidina Ibrahim departed from his people and then he went forth and went forth and we know he faced Nimrod. He spoke truth to power as they say today. Truth to the ultimate power who thought an arrogant power. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but then as he reached his old age, this Nabi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who from his childhood has been spreading the truth, who has been fearless in spreading the truth, as he reaches his old age, he doesn't have any children. He doesn't have any children. And by the means of asbab, his wife Sarah was very old. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by that time towards his old age gave him another wife, Hajar alayhi salam. But he doesn't have any children. And so, if Allah bestows upon him a son, because when we know that Sayyidina Zakaria made dua for children, we know that Sayyidina Ibrahim made dua. They make dua from the intention of continuing the nubuwa, continuing that role that they have. So their dua is part of that ibadah. But just imagine if Sayyidina Ibrahim was to be tested in anything. He's tested in that one thing. That one thing that if he was ever to put his identity into something and to think this is where my hopes lie or through this I will live on it would have been his children because all his life that's what he was doing he was a prophet of Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only gave him a child he didn't know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would give him the miracle of children at old age his wife Sarah laughed how can I have a child when I'm so old? He didn't know Allah would bless him with Ismail and then later on bless him with Ishaq. He didn't know that. But Allah blessed him and then Allah blessed him with every single prophet that is mentioned in the Quran after Sayyidina Ibrahim being from his lineage. That's why his family becomes the family of Nabuwa, the family of prophethood. And the Prophet ﷺ is from his dua. So we rewind back. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala show him what appeared to him? Sayyidina Ibrahim is appearing to sacrifice his son Ismail. When the time comes, Shaitan appears, saying, don't do this, what are you doing? And three times Shaitan appears, and three times Sayyidina Ibrahim throws a rock. Three times. Why don't you just listen for a moment? <laughs> Shaitan speaks sense, of course he does, to the thinking mind, because he's only going to come to you from the left, from the right, from the front and the back. Only going to come to you by that which will find some place in your nafs if you listen 
But Shaykh Sayyidina Ibrahim didn't want to listen. Why? Because his trust was already in Allah. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala la yukhlifun mi'ad. He was already giving himself and utterly for Allah. He knew the only response to shaitan is... That's what the Prophet said. If you have whispers of shaitan, just spittle to your left. Or in this case, get a rock and if he comes in a physical form, pelt him. He's not worth listening to. He's regime, he's cursed. And then he went forth and he came to the point where he's sacrificing Ismail alayhi salam. But the knife is blunted. And then the response comes back, Qad sadaqta ruhya. You've been true to your dream. From the, if the dream was of the <coughs> sense that he was meant to dream something that was to come to pass in the literal sense, then he fulfilled the dream. Because the dream didn't show him killing his son. The dream showed him moving the knife as if he is. And he moved the knife and the knife was blunt. But if the dream was a Yusufiya dream, he still fulfilled it. Qad sadaqta ru'ya. He still fulfilled it. Because as some of the ulama say, whose books I've read about this, Sayyidina Ibrahim appearing to sacrifice his son, which later on Allah made symbolic through the, through the sheep or the lamb, was symbolic of one thing. That one thing that is most dearest to your heart, that when push comes to shove, could make you choose other than Allah. If Sayyidina Ibrahim, that was the one thing, but he, would, he succeeded in that test because he was Khalil of Allah. وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ those who truly believe, love Allah more than anything else. And so why was Sayyidina Ibrahim's dream, a Yusufiya dream, as much as it was a real dream? And because in his dream it was manifest as his son. Are you willing, if there was to be a situation, Allah doesn't want sacrifice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't even want the sacrifice of the goat or the sheep or the cow. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that in the Qur'an. It's not about the, the literal thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the luhum wa dima, the blood and, and the meat of this doesn't reach Allah. Allah doesn't want the sacrifice of that in that sense. Allah wants the symbolic re reality of that sacrifice, which is your taqwa. Which is how much of you are for Allah? How much of you can say no to other than Allah? So Eid al-Adha is the Eid when we remember the Sunnah of Sayyidina Ibrahim, which is a Sunnah each and every one of us should be following when we do the sacrifice of the lamb or the sheep, which is taking that one thing. You might know what you have to know what it is for yourself. Yours isn't necessarily going to be Sayyidina Ibrahim's. Maybe, and I told my wife this, instead of giving the khutbah, if I just said, let's just pause five minutes, figure out what that one thing is for you. If Allah was to test you with one thing, what would that be for you? Could be your job. It could be if Allah tests you in something, then you turn your back on Allah. What's the one thing for you? That you've made so big that it's become an idol because when Sayyidina Ibrahim destroyed the idols, the idols of stone and clay were only physical manifestations of ta'alluq al-qalb, the idolatry of the heart because all idolatry, all idolatry, all aghyar, all otherness starts from the heart. That's, all, that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ara'ayta man ittakhada ilahahu hawa. Have you not seen the one who takes his God, his own desires? So did you and me, and if we didn't do an Eid al-Adha, the good news is you get to make that intention every day. But did any of us at that point think about what is that? And don't start with second, third. 
because we have to start with that one thing. Usually that one thing has so many things built into it. It's like a necklace. If you can get that one thing out of your heart, all of the other things fall out of your heart. The question to ask yourself is, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't give me this, or if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took this away from me, where would I be with Allah? Where would I be with Allah? And that one thing when you find, when you find that one thing, and believe me, we have to go in deep because if we're not going to go in deep, we're not going to be people of reality. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says time and time in the Quran, الْأَلْبَاب. It's only the ulul albab, the people of depth, the people of course who get this book, the Quran. Otherwise, the Quran is just like someone says, I know this person. Oh, what is it you know about him? Well, his skin looks like this. People of qashar, people of the outward. And we're not people of the outward, we want to be people of Al-Bab. So the only way you can be Ul Al-Bab, people of course, is if you learn to go into your core and see where are you interacting with this religion from. And so go into your core, find out what your heart really wants, find out who it is you really worship, find out why you're here, find out what is the goal of your life, what is your qasd, what is your hadaf, because the hajj is just another name for qas aim. What do you really want? Because unless you can find that answer and find the aghyar, find the otherness of what you want, you will not be able to say, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, and kill it. Because if you don't kill it, you'll spend the rest of your life going down and up as a Muslim, but worshipping Allah ala harfin, you were going down and saying Allahu Akbar, but in your heart was something else all that time. Because you couldn't kill it. Because you couldn't smash that idol. Eid al-Adha is just another way of reminding you, what is it that you want? What is it that you can give for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So Sayyidina Ibrahim's dream was a dream for you and me. It was our dream. It was as if Allah says, for Sayyidina Ibrahim, I put Sayyidina Ishmael in the image. But what it is, is really that one thing. That one thing that you will compete with Allah with. You now have to sacrifice that lamb on Eid al-Adha and defeat your one thing. Do your homework. What's your one thing? Because unless we do that, we're not going to leave, we're not going to live that, that life that Sayyidina Ibrahim led. He was pure. He wasn't of those who associated others with Allah. And there's shirkul jalli and shirkul khafi. There is that which is the outward association. And the one that's more dangerous is the one that's inward. Prophet wasallam said it's like a black ant on a black rock on a moonless night. Layers and layers of darkness. How are you going to realize that level unless you're willing to go in and dive into the depths of that darkness yourself? داخلين ووافق طاعتك أجمعين وطاعة رسولك سيد محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم نمين وطاعة من أمرت بطاعته عملا بقوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا وأطيعوا الله وأطيعوا رسوله للأمر منكم نفعني الله إياكم بالقرآن العظيم وبسنة نبيه الكريم صلى الله عليه وسلم قولوا قبل هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Al-Kareem Al-Tawwab, Jazeel Al-Thawab, Sariya Al-Hisab, Wa Ashadu An La Ilaha La Allahu Ahduhu La Sharika Lah, Wa Ashadu Anna Sayyidina Wa Nabiyina Muhammad Abdullahi Rasuluh, 
اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وعلى تابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين. سيدنا إبراهيم is being tested through his own family. Doesn't mean that Allah subhanahu wa taala wants us if we find in our hearts that I love my child so much, I love my wife so much. That if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was to take them away from me, I would not be able to pray. And therefore, that's wrong. Allah subhanahu wa wants us to love our family. That's why one of the biggest things that we can have is to join Silatul Rahim, to join between those who we're connected to. This is one of the greatest of deeds. But what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us is that our love and our hope be through Allah and not be a competitor and not be a competitor that's why I quoted the voice <laughs> those who truly believe they love Allah more Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't say they only love Allah as human beings we're designed to give our attention and love the part and parcel of that fabric in fact I don't have much to speak about in this khutbah in terms of time, but I believe that is the only re- that's the secret of Allah's creation. Rahma. We need to really, really, really unpack what that word means. Rahma. Why is Allah Subhanahu wa Taala started Bismillah, Rahman, and Rahim? Why is that that one verse where both of the names He chooses go back to that Rahma, that mercy? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Rahmi, Rahmati wasi'at kullu shay. My Rahma covers every single thing. Elsewhere, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa ulu al arham, ba'aduhum awla bi ba'ad fi kitabillah, inna Allah bi kulli shay'in alim. And that the people who are connected by arham wounds. They are closer to one another in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a hadith, it's a hadith Qudsi, as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is narrating. The Prophet says, and it's as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is narrating, he says, Ana Rahman. I am Rahman, the most merciful. Wa ana khalaqtu ar Rahim. And I am the one who created the womb. Washtaqaqtu laha min ismi. And I have given it the name from me. So the womb in Arabic is Rahim. And it has been given the name from Allah's name, Ar-Rahman. And whomsoever keeps that bond and strengthens it, then I keep that bond with me. And whomsoever breaks that bond, then I break that bond with me. The Ulul Arham are those who are connected to us by that bond. And this is something that we're meant to uphold. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elsewhere in the Quran says that your wives and your children can be enemies. From what perspective? How can it be both? Because whenever something becomes a thing in and of itself in a way of competing, then we need to ask, where is our love? How is our love coming with Allah and through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And so when we love, we love through the shuhud al-minna, seeing Allah's blessing. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says we make dua for our azwaj, for our husbands and wives and our children to be qurata a'yun, to be the coolness of our eyes. And this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that. Why did I say I'm going to end here very briefly why did I say that I believe this is the secret this is one of the major reasons of why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has brought everything into creation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we've said before and this would be a very big khutbah maybe a series of lessons to come to this but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to be known in this world that's the reason why everything has been created Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, so that Allah be worshipped and the mufassirun say ay li'arifun to be known because true ibadah, ibadah can only come through iqrar al through true slavehood or worship can only come through knowing his being the Rabb. And knowing his being the Rabb means knowing his asma, 
knowing his names and in all of his names there is a hierarchy and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says wa rahmati wasi'at kullu shay my rahmah encompasses all of these names he wants his rahmah to be known and he has made a physical part of womanhood specifically from that but rahmah as an attribute is not exclusive female attribute the most perfect person of rahmah was the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmatan lil alamin we didn't send you except to be a rahmah to all the world so i'll end here those two things they are in english we say corollaries they're connected to each other the first part of the khutbah i said which is getting out of your heart other than allah making tawhid real la ilaha illallah getting that inward out but the degree to which you get that inward other than allah out is the degree to which muhammad rasulullah becomes true the degree to which you become a rahmat lil alamin a flow outwardly to see this connection to be a person of rahmah in your life and it starts brothers and sisters with our families it starts with those closest to us so today's khutbah was a reminder of the significance of eid but also a reminder of the ul al arham those who are closest to us in these days and for us to this work is remains this work of purifying our hearts and this work of following the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is sunnah al 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 the outward and the sunnah of his inward which is the sunnah of being a rahmah for those around us هذا وصلوا وسلموا على من امرت بالصلاه والسلام عليه قال الله تعالى ان الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا ايها الذين امنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين وارض اللهم عن الخلفاء الراشدين ابي بكر وعمر وعثمان وعلي وان سائر الصحابه الاكرمين